All right, you ready to get in the Bible a little bit? Colossians chapter number two. Colossians chapter number two. Now, this morning we started off, for those of you that weren't able to be here for Sunday school, we started talking about just a brief overview of the book of Colossians. And Brother Holland, I don't know what you did to the air, but it seems to be working now. Maybe you put it on 60, but I appreciate it because it was warm. Uh, we started talking about an overview of things in the book of Colossians, and I told you the importance of knowing the truth is mainly so that you don't wind up getting deceived uh, when things come along, especially false teachers or individuals that go by emotionalism only. You are an emotional being, but you have to be careful about allowing your emotions to control everything. The Lord tells you to be angry, right? That's an emotion, but sin not. There's certain things that you should be angry about, but not to the point that it causes you to commit a sin. A love is an emotion, but if you love the wrong things, it can get you in a lot of trouble. Right? You have to love the right kind of things, meaning the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you put Him first, that love covers a multitude of sin. Now, some of you are going to struggle and so on and so forth with a matter that he'll get into later in Colossians, and that has to do with a matter of forgiveness. You can't do what God would have you to do if you don't love the Lord the way you have to love the Lord because you'll always have this attitude or idea, i got to be justified, and therefore you forget to forgive others even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. But that's a tough thing if your emotions aren't in the right place. And so he's fixing to give you some information here about expose or warn uh, about the lies and the trickery of people. And Paul's real good about this because he's very much aware because of who he is and where he comes from, how he was trained at the feet of Gamil. Paul knows all the little inside track, the little inside traits. One of the reasons that Dr. Ruckman went to school, this is out of his own mouth. This isn't some perception or something. This is something he told me directly. That one of the reasons that he got a PhD was so that he could fight them on the same field in which they chose to use over other people. So it's a smart way to go about it. He said, you can't fix it if you're not part of it. So he went there, but after he got the education, it didn't go to his head. But then when they would try to pull something, he'd say, you mean this, you mean this, you mean this, you mean this, you mean this. He'd have exposed their trickery because he had been trained. Well, if you read much material, that's great material to get your hands on. You say, why? It exposes people that are trying to lie to you about hyper-dispensationalism or Church of Christ beliefs about baptism or about the sacraments and all that. That comes from an individual who knew the tricks and Paul knows the tricks, but he also exposes the tricks. Knowing the tricks of somebody else doesn't do anybody any good unless you're willing to expose them for those things. We're going to pick it up, if you will, please, in chapter number 2. And uh, I'll tell you what we'll do. Let's come down in the interest of time. Look in verse... Well, just, just pick it up in 1. For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you, for them at Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh... Paul said, I'm worried about them. I have a conflict over them. I'm concerned about them. I haven't ever even seen their face. I just know about them by letters and by testimony. What is your conflict, Paul? That their hearts might be comforted. That their hearts being knit together in love that their hearts unto all riches of the full assurance and understanding and the acknowledgement of the mysteries of God and of the Father and of Christ in whom are hid all the treasures of the wisdom and knowledge. It's a pretty major thing there. He's saying, I I'm conflicted over that. I'm concerned about him. I'm worried about him because I want him to know him. Verse 4, And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. And for though I be absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the Spirit, joying and beholding your order, steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught abounding therein with thanksgiving. Watch. Now you're going to watch the rot step in right here. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after what? Got to be politics. Got to be prejudice. Got to be preferences. N no. After who? Christ. Most important thing in a man or a woman's life is what? Christ. Exactly. The fellowship with Jesus Christ. Right? Right? 
Second thing is Bible preaching. Brother Ernie, you pray. Ask the Lord to help us, would you please? Amen. Thank you. You can have a seat. Would you agree with me that the, the building is no stronger than its foundation? You don't really know how good the foundation is until a storm comes. So you know what they do? They have all kind of rules and regulations when you dig out footers and when you do the things that you're supposed to do, depending upon the height of the building as to how much deep the foundation has to go and how much steel and rebar has to go into the foundation. But you don't really know, even if the foundation's been poured in concrete or poured on concrete, if the soil is not sufficient to support the concrete, then you get sagging things and problems with stuff. I'm not trying to take you guys that are all contractors. I, I don't claim to be one. I just know enough to know that the Bible says, if you hear the words and do them, you're like a wise man who builds his house on what? A rock. So the foundation is, is hugely important. Here he says, rooted and grounded where? Two words. In Him. So here's the thing you got to recognize. Before he even starts talking about the things you need to add, the things you need to use to grow with, the things that you need to know, the first thing that's most important, you got to get your roots in the ground. No plant tops out above the ground before it's put roots down in the ground. You stick a seed in the ground, the first thing that happens is a little sprout doesn't start coming up and pop its head up above it. You know what it does? It puts roots down. You say, why? Well, where the roots are, that's where the water comes from. That's where the food comes from. That's where the nutrients come from. It picks up everything through the roots. And whatever it begins to pick up, if that soil is not good soil, you know what happens when that plant does begin to sprout up there? It's very, very weak and it's very prone to disease. And so what do you have to learn to do? Rooted and grounded, first of all, in your relationship with Him. Remember I've taught you before over in the book of Hebrews that it starts off there with Abel who offered a more excellent sacrifice. Your beginning of worship with the Lord begins with your willingness to do whatever God would have you to do. It doesn't start with working. The mistake many people make is, is they think working produces a walk or produces worship. No, you got it backwards. Working doesn't produce anything except work. Working won't make you a Christian. I know a lot of people that are in false cults and they're in false religions and they're in false churches and all that, and they work our, they work us to death. I mean, if you were to compare them, you'd say, good night, man. I mean, they're meeting themselves coming and going and all that. You know what he says about in Revelation chapter number 2 about the church at Ephesus? You know what he said? He said, listen, you know them that aren't mine and you know doctrinally what's right and what's wrong. You've even called out the people that needed to be called out. You know where Satan's seat is. You know this and you know that. And you're meeting yourself coming and going and you take the Lord's Supper and you do this and that and the other. But I do have something against you. Lord, what could you have against us? We're doing everything. We read our Bible, we study, we pray, we tithe, we support missionaries. Uh, we're faithful to come to church. We do everything that we're supposed to be doing. Lord said, yeah, but you forgot something. Yeah. Oh, what do you, what do you mean we forgot something, Lord? You left your first love. Yeah. The Lord has something against you. It's not the list of things you do. It's that first step. It's that worship that comes. You know what happens after that? The Bible says Enoch walked with God and he was not. Do you think your King James Bible is off a kilter there? It's off a little bit? Why does he put it in that order? Why does he put the worship begins with sacrifice with Abel before the walk comes? If you don't learn how to worship God, you'll never learn how to walk with Him. Amen. And you're not ready to go to work for Him. Right. People say, you know, well, now that I'm saved, I need to get out here and I start need to do whatever the list of things is for you to do. No, you got to learn how to worship Him first and then learn how to walk with Him. Amen. Amen. I like the song about in the garden. We used to sing it at the nursing home all the time. I come to the garden alone where the dew is still on the roses and He walks with me and He talks with me. They that wait upon the Lord shall mount up with wings of eagles and they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. Right? right. They shall walk and not be faint. You say, what do you have to learn to do? I have to learn to walk with Him. Amen. I have to learn to talk with Him. If you learn how to worship Him, you learn how to walk with Him, guess what will wind up happening? You'll find yourself working for Him. Yes. You won't even realize it. All of a sudden you're right in the middle of the permissive will of God doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing because you just did what He told you before. I learned how to worship Him and then I learned how to walk with Him. If you get those two things down, do you realize how far ahead of the majority of Christians you'll be? 
Most Christians don't know how to worship or walk. All they say is, well, I, I must be because I'm working all the time. Or you're just working up a sweat. You're not getting anything done. You say, why? Have you stopped at the altar lately? Have you learned some things about worship lately? When was the last time you walked with the Lord and talked with Him? We say, well, preacher, I, I'm, I'm beyond that now. <laughs> You're surely not ready to go to work. I'm ready to go to the mission field, preacher. I'm ready to go to Bible school, preacher. I'm ready to preach in the pulpit, preacher. I'm ready to teach a class, preacher. I'm ready to do this, and preacher. No, no, you're not. I'm in the passage right here. You say, what is that? Bang glory and bang deceit. That's an individual telling you that work produces a walk in worship. No, it doesn't. It doesn't produce it at all. As a matter of fact, by the time we get down to the, toward the end of the passage there, he's going to teach you about vain and false worship and the worshiping of angels and idols and all those other kind of things. You know what he's fixing to tell you about? He's fixing to tell you who told you that you had to have the world's approval to be what I consider to be a good Christian, meaning the Lord. That's a rudiment of the world. Does the world like you? If it does, you're in the wrong crowd. If the religion and the gods you serve, the world likes, you're in the wrong crowd. I realize that's contrary to modern Christianity. I understand clearly what most people think about that, but that's a biblical truth. The Lord was not loved by the world. The world, the, the world doesn't love the Lord now. As a matter of fact, they scoff at Him now. So you have to recognize and understand that one of the ideas that He tried to put you under is, everybody's supposed to like me because I'm a Christian. No, if you're a Christian, chances are better than not. You're going to have a few enemies. They're going to think you're a whack-a-mole because you're trying to serve the Lord. Not only that, they'll try to hijack your relationship with the Lord when you're trying to do what the Lord wants you to do, but they'll always tell you what they think the will of God is for your life. But they don't have to suffer the repercussions of it. And sometimes, I hate to say this, but I say it respectfully, you're so gullible that you let somebody else hijack your relationship instead of doing what he told you to do in the first place. I didn't expect to get many amens, but I did think I might get one or something there. Notice what it says, rooted and built up in Him, established. That means established. Uh, as you have been taught, abounding therein with what? That's a difficult thing, isn't it? And everything, give thanks. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Isn't that hard to do? Amen. Thankful in all things. Yep. Amen. And then he goes on down to say that. We're talking about Christian growth now. Beware. Why? Lest any man spoil you. Uh, spoil is a term they used back in those days. or the same thing as rob in or break in and steal from you. Not spoil in the sense of rot you, make you uh, like a like a rotten, like one of them big old tomatoes Brother Ernie brings sometimes, and the big things. You leave them sitting. I don't care how pretty they are. You don't get, get into them pretty quick. You know what happens to them? They rot. That's not what he's talking about. Not that kind of spoil. Not like spoiled milk or something. Spoil in the sense of a man coming in and stealing from you. You say, can false doctrine do that? Absolutely it can do that. If you're on the wrong doctrinal train, you know what can happen to you? You can lose rewards at the judgment seat of Christ right and left. You can burn up all kind of opportunities to do things for the Lord. He doesn't have to take stuff out of your bank account. Quit worrying about that. I got that question last week, you know. Well, do you think, you know, if I'm not living right, that the Lord goes into my bank account and takes stuff out sorry, of it? But, uh, sure, sure, yeah, He gives you something and then takes it back from you. No, it's in the bank. It's secure. You don't have to worry about what you've already put up in the bank. Worry about are you going to put any more in the bank. If you're out of fellowship with the Lord, I can guarantee you there ain't no deposits being made. You think the Lord's going to take that. Why do you want to make the Lord the bad guy? You're the bad guy. You're not doing what God wants you to do. So think it to yourself. You know what i got to do? I need to make a bank deposit. I don't know about you. I don't get a check if I don't work. And I'll live off the government. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, whenever I do happen to get whatever that stuff is that comes in that you get, that's money I put up a long time ago. That ain't the government's money. Do you pay, do you pay Social Security? That's for idiots that didn't put anything away for retirement. So that when you get old and can't take care of yourself... But but don't be careful though. That isn't the government taking care of you. You've been putting that money up for years. Some of us put it up to the tune of fifteen percent. You say, what is that? Called self employment tax. Sure, that's right. Well, you mean you pay, you pay taxes? Yeah, you pay taxes, don't you? Well, why should I not pay taxes? Right, amen. I pay the same taxes you do. Y'all look shocked. Ask the treasurer. He knows. 
You say, what? Here, preacher, here's your W-2. When I go off in places like that, if they hand me over $600, you know what I get? I get a W-2. You know what? If they don't give me a W-2, you know what I do? I claim whatever they gave me. You say, why? My testimony is not worth a few hundred dollars to the kid, you know, under the table from the government. I'm not talking about a gift. I'm talking about I went up there to preach. That's my job. That's what I'm supposed to do. Here, preacher, here's your offering. You're going to give me a W-2? Now nah, we don't worry about that here. Okay, write it down. Turn it into the CPA. <laughs> you say, why do you do that? Well, you, obviously you should know the answer to that. Amen. You know what he just said right here? Hey, this is one of the kind of things that are uh, the rudiments of the world. You know, well, you know, the government, you know, if, uh, if, good, if 10% is good enough for the Lord, it's good enough for the government. Well, hold on just a minute. You're blaspheming the Word of God. You say, no, I'm not. Yes, you are. According to what he tells you over there in the book of Peter, over there uh, where Peter says this, he said, uh, pay your taxes that the Word of God be not blasphemed. Yes, right. Pay your taxes. You say what? That's how you take care of your police right. and your firemen, right. which you don't like and you don't care anything about until you need them. That's it. It's a good investment. What do you think takes care of your roads out there? Right. Who do you think maintains your fire hydrants? Right, yep. So that when your building's burning down, they hook up a hose. You think these boys just roll out when they get ready? You see your fire truck out here? Man, I wish I had a job like that. You go ahead and run in a burning building. I don't want to go in there. We used to have the argument with the guys downtown all the time. We'd go to a real bad fire and I'd say, man, I don't want nothing to do with that. You know what they'd say? Every one of them. Not a single one of them did everything. Oh, I, I don't want to get shot at. And I said, okay, you put out the fires and I'll get shot at. They just got to guess it's whatever stirs your grits. But here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen. One of the rudiments of the world is, is to try to get you caught up that the Bible is so contrary to government that it's okay to rebel in the name of Jesus. No, that's wicked. You have no right to rebel against it. Peter says over there when he's talking about paying taxes, you know who's a, who is the ruler at the time? Nero. He's burning Christians. He said, pay your taxes. Well, bless God, I wouldn't do it. Okay, go to jail then. I'm not bailing you out. You say, why? You didn't pay your taxes. If I got to pay them, you got to pay them. Take this stuff under the table, junk like that. Why you, why you do stuff like that? You don't, your conscience don't bother you at all? Well, preacher, you know, I mean, we're on a different... Yeah, you are on something different. You're on cracks what you're on. Secular reasonings adds to the gospel or adds to the Bible. No, secular reasoning doesn't add anything to the Bible or to God. Amen. You know, we're just trying to make it more palatable. No, you're not. You're trying to fix it where you can compromise. Now, I've given you these before. I wrote them down and I just highlighted them to make sure we got them. Here's a couple of the rudiments. Well, you know how it is, preacher. You've got to make a living. You don't work to make a living. You work to live. Number two, you got to uh, get married. Everybody else does it. Paul didn't. Right. Right. Amen. Paul said, I would that you were as I am. But his wife wound up being the church near about. I mean, everywhere he was, he's all the time doing that. It's hard to do that and be married at the same time. Sure. Paul's saying, if you're going to serve the Lord, it's easier to serve the Lord without having a, uh, somebody not supporting you. Amen. Here's a good one for you. Well, it just depends on how you look at it, preacher. Right. Well, I'm looking at it right here. Amen. Pretty plain to me. Well, I don't know, preacher. Are you looking at it from the wrong direction? You read upside down? <laughs> you reading Braille? No, it depends on how you look at it. No, that's a guilty conscience talking. The Bible says it's wrong. It's wrong. But preacher, you see, you have to understand the time that the Bible is written to biblical times and now times have changed. So a lot of the things that were good for then are not good for now. Can I give you one? Same sex marriage. Isn't it odd to you that now with the recent court decision that all of a sudden all the women that didn't know if they were women now all of a sudden want to claim their authority over their own body as a woman? Well, I'm sorry, I thought you didn't know what you were. Well, if I am what other people think I am and I happen to have a watermelon seed growing inside and I want to be able to decide what I want to do, but you don't know what you are. And how do we even know what that is growing? Because if you, whatever you are, take he, whatever he is, to be whatever it is you're trying to be, how do we even know it's a pea? 
You got no idea. That's the epitome of insanity. It's like, how can somebody listen to that? And when they hear it coming out of their mouth, how can they say to themselves, well, that sure makes sense to me. What do you think, John? Well, the way I see it. What? If you're, are you hearing yourself right now? What's the best thing to do? Just turn it off. Here's a good one for you. Everybody else does it. I know when to quit. How's that one working out for you? Um, let's see. Do you want God to find you when you're doing whatever you're doing wrong? Do you want God to find you doing it? I'm just asking. If the Lord were to come right now, would you have to square away some things at the judgment seat before you can get to your rewards? I got a whole thing on this I'm going to have to wind up doing for you. Come on over a little bit further uh, to chapter or to uh, uh, verse number nine. But do you know what? I got a whole thing on the judgment seat of Christ. And the misconception about the judgment seat of Christ is, is that if I didn't confess my sin down here, when I get to heaven, it's just already done and taken care of. What makes you think so? I'm not talking about to get to heaven. You're going to go to heaven. Right. But if you have unsettled accounts with the Lord, what makes you think the Lord's not going to say, hey, come here. Lord, you ready to give me my reward? No, I'm here to talk to you about what I've been convicting you about and you never have gotten it fixed. Come on, amen. You going to enjoy that trip? No. What if the Lord shows you the same mercy and grace that you showed whoever it is you've got bitterness about now? <clears throat> yeah, I thought it'd get quiet there. Yeah, yeah. What if the Lord just says, well, you reap what you sow. You're crossways with me now. You're crossways with Him when you do that. Well, how about it? Can I get a witness? <laughs> I'm telling the truth. You say, what's going to happen? Man, you talk about fear and dread up there. It's not going to be about wood, hay, and stubble, and gold, silver, and precious stones. It's going to be about, we need to get this thing fixed. You need to get back in fellowship with me. What if it's a problem with a brother? The guy asked me a couple of weeks ago around the table up there at the place we were at, the Indiana. And he said, well, what if you got a problem? I said, it would be you and that brother in front of the Lord and he'll be the mediator. He's looking like this at the table. He's looking at the salt shaker. He said, that ain't good. I said, well, you got a chance to fix it now if you don't drop dead when you stand up and have a heart attack. Why would you say that? I said, well, you, I mean, it could happen. I'm not saying it's going to, but it could. What if it did? Well, if it did, what would I do? I said, you'll see it at the judgment seat. Right. Right. You think the Lord's going to let you go through eternity with that on your conscience? How come there's so much in the Bible about you getting things squared away? Right. You have a time of it, don't you? Does anybody besides my, one of my deacons and Miss Barbara amen that? Yeah, amen. Yeah. You have a time of it, don't you? Yes, right. Can you let the thing go? Amen. Oh, I, I'm sorry. You're judge, jury, and executioner, are you? You're God, are you? Well, if you only knew. And comparatively, what have you done to him? I'm not trying to be hard on you. You know what the rudiments of the world tell you? The rudiments where I say, I don't worry about confessing your sin. Don't worry about your fellowship with the Lord. You're saved. Live how you want to live. Don't worry about it. When you get over on the other side, if you didn't confess it, you get over there, the Lord puts it as far as the east is from the west. That has to do with your salvation. That has nothing to do with your fellowship. You think He's going to let you in the house up there and act like y'all are having fellowship together and you and Him have been at odds already? You honestly think that? Don't you think that would make Him unrighteous? Yes. Do you think the Lord is going to be afraid to say, Hey, I'm going to talk to you. Well, Lord, I don't, we don't talk about those kinds of things. No, you don't talk about those things. I do. That's hard. Some of you look, you, you literally, you look shocked. You're thinking, well, what if that's true? Well, I happen to know it's true. Yes, amen. You want to go by the what if? Well, 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 how about this? How about you just err on the side of being safe? Okay. How about if I tell you that the police are right down here around the corner. They're parked over there in the Bob Evans restaurant. And I wouldn't go speeding down here. Now you just go ahead and run Lickety Split just in case he's already got somebody else, okay? Or are you going to err on the side of caution and run about five miles under the limit? That's it. Right. I know what you're going to do. 
Okay, well, let's use the same analogy. You know you're going to face the Lord. Well, what are you going to do? Why don't you err on the same side of caution? Amen. 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 Why don't you make it right? Amen. What's wrong with making it right? It ain't always easy to make it right, but it's always right to make it right. Amen. <laughs> Some of you folks, man, right now, you look like you drank the poison and you're expecting the other person to die. <laughs> You're like the veterinarian that he went and he said he had a 100% cure rate. And one of the guy goes over, he says, man, take, my, take your dog over there. He, you know, he cured my dog. And he said, okay. So he took him over there. He gave him some medicine. The dog drank it and filled, it, you know, filled up his water bottle there with it. And the dog drank it. And the dog died. And he went back to his other friend and he said, man, you told me that guy cured him. He said, what happened to him? He said, well, the dog took the medicine and the dog died. So what happened to your dog? My dog died. 100% cure rate. <laughs> you keep sucking on that bottle, you're going to die. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Better let it go. Amen. Look, if you will, please, in verse number 9. In verse number 9. For in Him dwelleth the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you're complete in Him. Notice, in whom the circumcision made without hand, buried with Him in baptism and risen. This is a tough verse on the Campbellite here. With Him through the faith of the operation of God. That baptism there has nothing to do with water. It has to do with you being in the faith. That's how you got baptized by the Spirit. And you being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, hath He quickened together with Him, having forgiven you of a few of the trespasses. You better underline that word all. Yes, Some of you still struggle with that guilt monkey. Preacher, do you know what I did? No, and I don't want to know. But he knows. You say, what happens? Let me, let me give you a word of caution here, okay? Just real quick, I'm just going to throw this in here. You want to be careful about trudging around in other people's mess. You say, why? It invariably gets stuck on you. Any of you ever been around a hog farm at all? God, help us, please. That's good for y'all. I didn't know that. Well, good for y'all. Y'all don't even need the illustration then. But I'll use it because I got it. It's in my notes. So. You, know, you know, you don't have to get in the slop with the hogs for people to know you've been around the hogs. Right? And you know what happens? The hog farmer I knew up in Tennessee, and he had the biggest setup, best, prettiest setup, cleanest setup, as much as you can make pigs clean. I mean, he had a setup and a half. He would walk in. You wouldn't even have to turn around. You could smell. You say, what? A, he was deadened to the smell. He didn't smell hogs. Boy, everybody around him. And... You, you know how hogs smell? You, listen, if you have a problem eating bacon and you struggle with it, and you know you shouldn't be eating too much of the bacon, go to a hog farm. It'll cure you from sucking eggs. You'll get that smell in your nose. You say, what happens? We went and visited the hog farm. She wanted to see the little shoats, you know, and that kind of thing. And, you know, looks at the little mama, the big, mo big mama, <laughs> laying out there. Got all these little piglets on her and all that kind of stuff. And they got her fixing one of them pens so she can't roll over and crush the babies. And, oh, look at the little baby, look at the little baby. She's talking about little babies. And we walk back across the pasture and go up to the little place that we were staying up there. She said, what does that smell? I said, it's pigs. She goes, I didn't, I didn't mess with them. I didn't get that close to them. I said, you got close enough. You say, what'd you wind up doing? Hanging the clothes outside the house. You say, what did you do? I don't know if they torched them or not. We didn't put them in a suitcase. You say, what is that? You don't have to be in the hog pen to smell like the hogs. When it comes to trafficking in other people's trash, it'll stick on you and you'll smell just like you had it on you yourself. Secondly, if you don't traffic in other people's trash, you don't have to worry about them trafficking in yours. Just stay out of the trash can. Just the best thing for you to do. That's just a suggestion to you now. But you got to be real careful about that. You know what he said? You've been forgiven. Okay, accept the forgiveness. It doesn't matter if everybody else agrees with it or not. God's the one doing the forgiving. He said you're forgiven. Now, can you get past your past? You've had a shower in the blood, hadn't you? You're clean and pure. You left the old man outside. You left the clothes hanging out there and let him burn the clothes. You don't care. You got on a fresh set of duds. You're all clean. Nobody has to know. Does anybody know anything about the prodigal being in the pig pen after he came back to the father's house? There's no mention of it because you know why? He don't keep talking about while I was down there, I was out in the far country. And while I was in the far country, wrecking what I did in the far country, you know where I wound up? I wound up in the pig pen. See these old stained feet? Yes, because I was in the 
pig pen. Look what I've done. One of them pigs got a hold of me. I can't straighten my finger no more. And all that. See them pig? No, he don't mention it no more. You know what he starts talking about? Boy, the Father sure is good, ain't he? Boy, sure is a blessing to be back with the Father. Boy, the Father has plenty of bread to eat. And I'll tell you what, even his servants have plenty of bread. You know what? I'm no more worthy to be called his son. But he keeps calling me a son. You know what he did? He put a ring on my finger. He put shoes on my food. He put a clothes on. And guess what? He killed the fatted calf, man. Can you imagine that, man? I'm over there by the beginning of the day, and I would have filled my belly with hog's food. But they wouldn't even let me eat the hog's food. I came over home starving to death. He put out a steak dinner, about a 16-ounce ribeye there, cooked medium, got a little bit of butter melting down the side of the thing right there, some broccoli covered in a cheese sauce, some mashed potatoes and gravy, hot biscuits, man. I mean, he put on the dog, and I was starving to death. Why would you talk about when you were starving to death? Right. Talk about what the Lord set the table with. Amen. Enjoy the feast, man. Don't keep going back and doing that and beating yourself up. That's the world telling you to do that. I know where you came from. Hey, you got a tramp stamp? Cover it up. And if you don't know what it is, good for you. But I don't need to know what you did when you were 15. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. Shouldn't matter to anybody else. We're not on display around here. <gasps> did you? What's wrong with you, man? You're trafficking in trash. You know, the Lord don't like that stuff. You know what He says? Hey, I forgave them. I don't care if you forgive them or not. Leave them alone. You want to get sideways with the Lord, you take one of His trophies of His grace. A testimony of His grace. And keep messing around with Him and see what He does to you. He'll blister your hind end. Do you ever realize, you ever look at who the Lord has helped out? You ever look at it? Look at how He resurrected Samson. Most everybody knows Samson messed up with Delilah. But you know what you remember most about him? He killed more in his death than he did when he was alive. He finished right. Look what he did to Moses. Moses killed a man 40 years on the backside of the desert with the Midianitess priestess over there. And, and father-in-law was the Midianite priest. He was going to inherit everything over there. And the Lord called him out of that and said, yeah, forget it. He don't bring it up no more ever again. And so his father-in-law comes in and tries to tell him how to run the church. And Moses said, some ain't right here. And then before long, you know what the Lord said? Come on up here on the mountain. I'm going to let you see where you're going, but I'm going to put you to bed with the shovel. And then Mount Transfiguration, he pulls him up there after Michael the archangel goes and digs him up. Right. And he brings him up there and he shows up on the Mount of Transfiguration. He says, hey, how you doing, Elijah? He said, good, Moses, how you doing? He said, well, the Lord didn't kill me. And the Lord said, don't speak too soon. It will come. Your day's coming. And Elijah said, yeah, I heard about that. I'm going to lose my head. Moses said, well, I'm going to lose mine too. And they're up there talking on the Mount of Transfiguration. And Moses says, ain't this something? And Elijah says, what you mean, ain't this something? He said, I've been preaching through all these parts, man. I've been all up on these mountains and this and that and the other. Moses said, you know, I've never been here before. He said, what do you mean you've never been here before, man? And you lead the children out of Israel, out of Egypt over there, and you bring them over here into the promised land and so on and so forth. He said, no, nah, Lord never let me come over here. He just let me see it. He said, I never knowed when he killed me. Sorry, he's a southern Moses. He said, I never knowed when he killed me. I, I never knowed he was going to resurrect me and bring me over here and let me stand on the mountain where the second coming is going to take place and then allow me the privilege of preaching in the tribulation while I'm going to walk through all those built cities and all the other stuff. There ain't going to be no giants around there. He said, man, we're going to double team them. Elijah, I'm going to preach a little while, throw out a couple of miracles. You're going to preach a little while, throw out a couple of miracles. And then guess what? We're going to irritate the whole crowd so bad. You you know what they're going to They're going to cut our head off and they're going to throw them in the street. Now we're going to be up there with the Lord for a while. Then he's going to make us come back and he's going to attach our body to our head and then take us out of here. Elijah said, man, that sounds like some preaching to me, boy. That sounds good. And Moses says, man, I feel like I'm on holy ground. The Lord said, no, that was over yonder on. Well, how about that? You are getting pretty close, aren't you, Moses? He said, yes, sir. I feel like I maybe, uh, maybe I should take my shoes off. Elijah said, well, why are you taking your shoes off, man? He said, uh, I about got in trouble one time. I started approaching the Lord there. He was in the bush, and the bush was burning. And he said, the Lord had to warn me to take my shoes off, and I made a promise. The Lord will never have to tell me where holy ground is. He says, I tell you what I better do, man. Amen. And Elijah said, well, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. <laughs> Moses said, Rome, what are you talking about? He said, no, man, you wouldn't understand that. <laughs> And the Lord says, what you doing up here barefooted? He said, Lord, we felt like we was on holy ground. Amen. And about that time, right before their eyes, the Lord's transfigured. <laughs> I mean, they're seeing him in a second advent appearing. Amen. 
I mean, you can talk about all the miracles. Charlton Heston, you know, let my people go. <laughs> Holds out the rod, whoosh, the water separates and stuff like that. Elijah calls down fire from heaven, does all the miracles that Elijah does. And they're standing there in front of the Lord. And the Lord said, top that, boys. <laughs> no, sir. Amen. We wouldn't dare. And the Lord said, well, how about this? And about that time, Pete comes up and he goes, man, what in the world? And he looks over there and he sees the bare feet of Elijah and he sees the bare feet of Moses. And he sees a couple of feet over there with some diamond-sized holes in the, in the feet because it's the second advent appearing, so it would be after the crucifixion, but it's apparent after it took place, but it's just now taking place. Pete says, I believe I'm going to take my shoes off, man. The Lord said, Pete, what are you doing? He said, uh, they got theirs off. He said, but I got to do one better. How about let's build three tabernacles? Yeah. Now, people can say what they want to say, but Peter's got something there. Yeah. You say, why? Boy, he knew something good when he saw it. Yeah. And you know what he wanted to do? He didn't want it to end. That's right. I've been in some church services before, and you're thinking, Man, I hope this don't end. I was in a meeting one time over in Madison. Many of you heard me tell it before. The old preacher and me, it's August, hot, blazes, man, 90-something degrees, big old thunderstorms coming up, just booming, man. It sounds like cannon fire, like artillery fire, just going across, lightning dancing out across the sky. Not that down-to-earth lightning, that stuff that runs out across like a witch's fingers all the way across the, the sky, man. And, and preacher's worried about the, the uh, paper getting wet because you use this newsprint stuff, and if it gets wet, man, it gets like mush. It's like paper mache. And he's worried about it. He said, man, that'll be like drawing on a bed sheet, man. He said, you got to get that stuff in there. And I said, preacher, I can't go any quicker than they let me go through. you got to get it inside. you got to get it inside. I said, preacher, I'm, I'm trying to get it inside. And we get inside, and we find Finally get it. Man, I mean, it came down caught uh, uh, cats and dogs and chickens and everything else in the world, man. And those guys are standing out there. That thunder's rolling, man. You thought they were standing out there in the middle of artillery fire. You thought you're looking at line warfare there. they bringing them out there. They have to march in formation. They come out there and they turn their 90 degree corners. They come to the corner and they stop. And then they turn that corner and they stop. And then they make that line and they're standing. And I told the preacher, they're going to cancel it. They're going to cancel it because this is a bad storm. They're going to lock them down. It's maximum security. They're going to lock them down. He said, well, just pray, brother. Just pray. I'm thinking, you're telling me to pray? I mean, you feel so inept. It's kind of like, me pray, why don't you pray, man? I mean, you're the one that's got the hookup, man. I mean, that's what I'm thinking. Pray, brother, pray. And I'm thinking, I'm praying. And it's obvious it ain't working, it's still raining. You know, pray, man, pray. You know, it's like, it's my fault, it's raining. You know, and they come out there, man, it's standing. They got these little look like railroad caps on, and light blue, and that water's just sheeting off the bill of those things, and they're standing there looking straight ahead, man. And then the correctional officer calls them out there, Smokey the Bear hat. They come up there to the thing. They walk into the door of the chapel. As soon as they walk in, they grab that hat. They shake that hat off, man. I mean, that head goes down. And before I know it, man, there's an altar nearly the size of this the, from right there all the way over this way. And those guys are coming in. They're not going to a seat. They come right up to the altar. And then they're two deep, and then they're three deep, and then they're four deep, and they got their hands on each other like this, and they're praying. And the old preacher, he's up there now. You know, he's getting ready to draw. I'm sorry if you've heard this story, but I love this story. He's getting ready to draw and things like that. And he... He says, uh, man, he said, we're going to have a meeting tonight. I said, preacher, why do you say that? He said, because they are starting where we usually finish. Amen. Well, they got done, and then he said, uh, 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 chaplain, you got a guy here that leads the music? He said, no, sir, we don't. He said, peacock, get up there and lead them in a song. I look like a peacock, okay, man. I'm up there flapping around, couldn't get off the ground for nothing, you know, and I'm flapping around and leading them in amazing grace. And they got a kind of a, I don't know, man, it's just kind of a sad singing sort of, I, man, I mean, it, but it's spiritual. It's not carnal. You don't feel like doing the Watusi or nothing like that. It, it, I mean, they start singing that amazing grace, man. It run chills up your spine. 
And I hear the preacher going, mm, mm, like that under his breath. Mm, mm. They knew all four verses of that thing. They never skipped a beat, man. I'm just up there just kind of leading them along this way, you know, and doing, acting like I'm leading. I'm not leading, man. I'm enjoying the song, man. They get done singing and they sit down. The preacher gets to drawing. It gets quiet. Everything's settled. I mean, just, just deadly quiet. And you'll hear off in the distance that thunder just blow, 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 blow. And then you'll wait and then directly you'll see like somebody lit off a flash cube inside the building. He's steady drawing. He ain't missing a beat. One time that lightning flipped and went off so loud, I mean so bright, and came in those windows. He's drawing like this. You could see a perfect shadow of him while he's drawing. He's drawing Jesus on the cross right there. I can see him right now just like it happened yesterday. And he's up there. He's a little shorter. He's around here like this. <laughs> and he's drawing this way like this. And then he looked at that and he said, you see that, fellas? He said, you know what that is? He said, that's coverage. He said, you know something, boys? Now, see, he could call him that because he was 90 at the time he's preaching this. 90. Or 89, I think he was. And he said, you see that, boys? He said, that's coverage. And then he, just like if this was the board right here, he stepped around behind the board and he said, now, boys, you know what I'm doing? He said, I'm not going to hell. I got coverage. Amen. And they didn't say anything. And he peeped around the board like this and he said, Did you hear me, boys? I said, I got coverage. Have you got coverage? And man, that thing hit like a bolt of lightning hit in that place. And a guy jumps up over here. Then a guy jumps up over here. The next thing I know, they're standing on the pews. They've taken off their prison jackets. They're swinging them around. They're hollering. The correctional officers are backing up to the door. You know, they're talking back and forth. It's so loud they can't hear anything like that. And I'm sitting there on the front. I mean, I'm wild-eyed, man. It's like I'm there, but I ain't there. <laughs> Whether in the body, out of the body, I cannot tell, man. The Lord knoweth, man. And we're sitting there, and it got so loud, he just waited. Yeah. He just waited. And then he winds up getting finished with the thing, and we had several of those, those men get saved and pass out the material. And we're coming out after that whole... I mean, they're drenched, soaking wet, and stuff like that. You never heard them complain one time about it raining. Amen. No one time. I'm talking soaked like they're standing back here in my shower and they walk. I'm talking soaked, man. Not no little sprinkle. I mean soaking wet. Made to stand out there in it. Not complaining. Come in. Sit down. Some of them get saved. Had a real meeting with the Lord there. And the preacher says, he says, ain't it something that of all the place the Lord has to go to get glory, He has to come to a maximum security prison? Amen. We get over there and we're putting all the stuff up like that. And I said... Uh, Preacher, he said, go ahead and crank up the truck. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm going to. He said, today. <laughs> I said, I'm going to. Eventually. I said, what was that? And he said, yeah, what was that? He said, I've only seen that happen two other times in my life. And I said, I've never seen anything like that. I've been in some great meetings. Here it is, just an old man and a hay boy drawing a picture and preaching Jesus. And there's about no less than 175, 200 guys in there, maximum security prison, Bad thunderstorm outside, man, banging around in there like a BB in a boxcar. And I said, Preacher, I don't, I don't understand what just happened. I said, I, I, I don't. He said, Did you feel like you were sitting there almost like watching yourself? And I went, How'd you know that? He said, I'm not trying to be strange or weird. He goes, But uh, what the Lord did for you is give you about a thimbleful of what heaven will be like. And he said, it's like it's real, but you can't explain it. We're still sitting there. Sweat running off of us. I hadn't cranked the truck up yet. We just sat there. Watched the sun go down the ball of fire down over the hill back there behind the barbed wire and stuff like that. He said, man, that was something. We rode that thing for three days. He said, what do you mean rode it? Do you just... 
Just laugh about everything. <laughs> about to run out of gas. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, it's like, I said, preacher, what one more? He said, you got the proper perspective of things. He said, when you get a little taste of heaven, the things that you're so troubled with, he said, they just melt away. I'm trying to put a microphone over him. We're in the little building over here. I'm trying to put the microphone on. And I couldn't get the thing on his tie. His tie was fly, flapping around like it would, you know, the ones where he'd take the back and snip it off, you know, and that kind of a thing. Instead of retying it, he'd just take the, you know, he'd just cut it off, you know. <laughs> I don't need it no more, you know. And so I'm trying to get it on there. And then I got tickled. Then he started laughing. I said, what are you laughing about? He said, you. <laughs> I said, why, why, this ain't funny. What's, it, what's funny? He goes, they won't get it. That was two days after the thing happened. You say, what was that? That's the Lord showing up for real and saying, have I been good to you? I've never had that happen again. I've been in some good meetings. You can't orchestrate it. We didn't do nothing special. Sang Amazing Grace. They prayed, sang Amazing Grace. Preacher preached. God showed up. I sure am glad I was there though. Amen. Amen. I can't even, I'm not even describing it even now. I'm thinking about it and I'm thinking, how would I even describe it? <laughs> I don't even know how to tell you. I know it was supernatural. Yes. I sure am glad I was there. It didn't have anything to do with my righteousness. It's just God had mercy on a That's bunch a of people Amen. in a prison. Those guys in that prison experienced something that some people have been saved their entire life, never saw nothing like that. I was glad I was there to see it. Preacher, what's the point? Uh, the point is, is to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ and to recognize that it's in Him and by Him your forgiveness is there. He laid that lash on Jesus up there and He starts calling out sins. By the way, just so you know, in the Bible there's over 700 of them. It ain't just 10. So don't tell me you ain't guilty of one out of 700. And he's laying on those stripes, man, and those grown men are sitting there. They're in all, most of them for the rest of their life, man, at least for 25 year stretches and not one time, they're not saying any of them don't deserve it. And I look up, man, I mean, tears running like stinking water down a mountainside after a rainstorm, just pouring off of their cheeks and then wiping their cheeks, wiping their cheeks and unashamed, boy, I'm telling you, I didn't see nothing like that. He's laying that sin up there. You say, what are you trying to get across to me? He forgave you. Now forgive yourself. You may still have to pay. None of them got out. That preacher would get to do it. I'm just going to close out with this. I'm, I'm, I'm getting my mind ready to go to camp now and getting kind of antsy, ready to get moving. That preacher would get to preaching sometimes and, and all of a sudden you'd see him. He'd find it would just be another gear. It'd just be a, it, it, just, it would just happen. It was just a switch. And he'd feel kind of like a little like a depressing spirit in there, you know. And he all he used to talk about it. It used to bother him. He'd say, you know, boy, it's a terrible man. I mean, they miss God been in there. One of the guys in Rayford, he'd been in there for 20 years already. He said, man, that's 20 Christmases. That's 20 Thanksgivings. That's 20 family reunions. That's 20 years without a wife. 20 years without kids. 20 years with no contact with the outside world. Man, he said, I'd rather them just shoot me like a dog than to be in here in a box for 20 years, he'd say. 20 years, man. Can you imagine? 20 years you watch the sun rise and set in a box. It bothered him. And he'd get to sense in that. I think sometimes he'd recognize it. And then he'd all of a sudden, he'd just change gears. He'd turn around and he'd say, now, uh, you know what, fellas? And hold that chalk like this. He says, you know what, fellas? He said, the day's coming when the Lord himself is going to descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And he said, you know what's going to happen, boys, when that happens? And they get still. He'd hold them, boy, spellbound, man. I mean, just they'd just be sitting there hanging on every word. And I, he'd say, uh, you know what's going to happen? He said, you boys ain't going over the barbed wire. And they'd sit back like... He said, you're going to go slap dab through the ceiling. And you'd see them all sit up and brighten up. <laughs> We're in a...
meeting one time and one of the fellows says, boy, that sounds like a winner to me. <laughs> and preacher went up after it was over. He said, uh, don't need to know details. Or he said, how long? He said, I'm a lifer, preacher. He said, but what you told me tonight, it gave me hope so I know I can stay here till the Lord either by death or rapture comes and get me. And he said, so I can go slap, dab through the ceiling. <laughs> Now, you know what you need to realize, whatever you've got going on. There is a day coming where the Lord's going to descend from heaven with a shout and the voice of the archangel and trump of God. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. And what these kids are up here singing to you about, he's got me in the refiner's fire. He's got me in the refiner's fire. He's burning me up. But boy, when he brings me out, i got more of his image. Every time he brings me out, I look more like him. And then one day, you know what's going to happen to you? You're going to wake up and all of a sudden that back that's bothering you right now, you're going to think, man, my sacroiliac is doing all right. And them knees that ache bother you, you know, all of a sudden you're thinking, man, I feel like I could kick a ball. I'm feeling pretty good. I feel like Elijah ready to run a race. Right. And you go to put your glasses on, you're thinking, my goodness, man, what in the world must have fingerprints all over them? <laughs> and then you realize you don't need glasses no more. Come on. And you're looking there in them choppers over there in the glass, you know, sitting there in the <laughs> denture cream and all that kind of a deal, the poly dent, the green stuff, you know. And you reach down and grab them. You go to put them in. You bite your finger when you put your teeth in. You're thinking, what in the world, man? Your teeth grow back. And you look and the hair you lost has grown back. The hair that turned gray is a right color. And you look in that mirror, man, and you know what you see? Looking back at you, you see Jesus Christ. And you're thinking, I never saw nothing. Looks that good ever. What a... What in the world? You feel better than you've ever felt. There's a burden and lift it off of you. Yeah. And you all of a sudden have that, well, I ain't worried about nothing. <clears throat> Who cares? Ain't this a blessing? I wonder what's happening to me. And about that time, you're going to hear Gabriel up there. You thought Justin blew the horn this morning, which is the best I've ever heard him play. But you heard thought Justin blew the horn this morning? Wait till you hear Gabriel play. He plays one of them big long horns without the valves in it. He knows how to play the horn without having to do the valves. He does it with his lips. And he licks his lips and the Lord says, let her rip. And he showers down on that horn and the Lord says to you, come up hither and your problems are gone. Wave bye-bye to this sad sack of a world, man, and all your problems and difficulties with it, and all the people left below are going to see nothing but the bottom of your bare feet. <laughs> now, don't spit on them when you're rising. You're going to feel like you should. You know what you're going to do? You're going to go up there, and you're going to be in the presence of the king. Amen. Yeah, preacher, they've been telling me that for years. Well, you're one day closer. Amen. And what is it you got on you right now? You say, how long am I going to be there in that condition, preacher? Till God dies. Preacher, when does God die? He never dies. And then everything you got that's got you balled up right now, all of a sudden, just gone. And you'll think, man, Lord, this is really something I... Sure wish I hadn't got sidetracked on this and that and the other. I, my goodness, Lord, I had no idea the splendor of that place, the magnificence of that person will be so overwhelming. I think that you, you just sort of lose your, you lose your legs. Maybe the Lord scoops you up and carries you across the threshold and says, Welcome home, honey. The choir begins to sing the Hallelujah Chorus. Perfect harmony. The angels are standing there at attention, blowing their horns. You never heard an orchestra sound like that in your life. And you're marching in, and they're all saying, Boy, we're glad you're home. Boy, we're glad, like you've been gone forever. Boy, we're glad you're home. Man, we're glad you're home. This is wonderful. We sure are glad you're home. Welcome, welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Good to have you home. And you're thinking to yourself, I must be dreaming. 
I must be dreaming. I gotta be dreaming. It can't be this good. And the Lord said, it gets better. You know what it does? It gets better. That's what you got to look forward to. Rooted, established, grounded in Him. Forgiven of all your sins by Him. Now accept your forgiveness and run along. The world says to you, well, you know, you can't. No, the Lord forgave me. He's the one holding the keys to the kingdom, so leave me alone. He forgave me. Say why? Because He loves me. Because He's gracious. Because He's kind. Because He's merciful. Because He's long-suffering. I don't have to experience His wrath. Well, what did you do to get that? I gave Him my sins. <laughs> you gave Him your sins? Yes, I gave Him my sins. I mean, but, but what else did you do? Nothing. That's all I had to offer Him. I didn't give Him my life. It wasn't worth, it wasn't worth having anything. I gave him my sins. That's what he wanted. Well, your sins are what are going to send you to hell, isn't it? Yeah. Well, what did he do with them? He bore them on a tree for me. And when he got done, you know what he did? He took them down there and dropped them off in hell and said they can stay there from now on until I die. Leave my kids alone. That's the forgiveness you've got if you're saved. Father, bless your word. Bless these people, especially in such unusual times as this, that they would come to church on a Sunday evening and to sit and listen to folks sing and to preach or preach. Thank you for their faithfulness. Thank you for their willingness. I pray you'll be with the folks that are out that are listening, that you might comfort them and care for them, watch over them. Lord, help us as we go to camp and all the preachers that are going to preach and all the things that are going to be done, not just give us physical safety, but Lord, would you please give us a spiritual renewal and a refreshing, a revival as it is. Help us to help these kids, some of them from as far away as Colorado, come over just to be a part of camp. And pray, God, that you'll help us to send them back where they came from and they might go back refreshed and renewed. And so they might be able to be a blessing to the churches they come from. And pray, Lord, you'll watch over the flock while we're gone now. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.